All right. Thanks, John. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about magmatically driven flexural uplift of the central Cascades arc encoded by fluvial incision of the Columbia River Gorge. And this is work I'm doing with Lee Carlstrom, my advisor, as well as collaborators Charles Cannon, Ray Wells, and Jim O'Connor from the U.S. Geological Survey. So I kind of self-identify as a geomorphologist, um, but I'm doing work in the Cascades. And so that's forced me to really start to think of surface processes as the surface expression of these very deep earth processes, um, and particularly magmatic processes in this case. And so kind of the fundamental question of this whole talk is how are volcanic arcs formed? So in this map of the world, all of the purple lines represent convergent volcanic mar margins. And these are places where some of the most iconic, geologically active, fastest growing topography on earth is made. But we really have a pretty limited understanding of how these mountain ranges develop on geologic timescales. And so what we're trying to do is really disentangle the different factors and identify what kind of the first order forcings are on these kinds of landscapes. So what components are there? Um, when we think of mountain building broadly, often what we think of is plate tectonics. Um, so these are diagrams of a few particular arcs in New Zealand up here, a subduction zone where the arc is centered on a bunch of rifting normal faults. Um, Sumatra, the arc is located in kind of this transform margin. And in Japan, where the arc is, the crust is under compression. And so, you know, these things are built right in the middle of these slow motion geologic car wrecks at convergent plate margins. So the tectonics tends to be pretty complicated and a little bit hard to understand. Um, so superimposed on top of that, we then get volcanic processes. And so how are we gonna build topography through volcanic processes? Well, the first thing people usually think of is through eruption, right? Um, we get erupted lava flows like the Parkdale flow here just outside of uh, Hood River, Oregon. And then obviously the construction of these massive volcanic edifices like we see here in Mount Hood. And this stuff, you know, this makes it really hard to disentangle the geologic history and arcs because it tends to repave the geologic surface, thus obscuring geologic strain markers um, and any kind of clues we have to the geologic past. But in addition to these constructional deposits, we also have magmatic intrusion. And so um, these are just a couple examples where people have inferred a pretty profound elastic response to magma getting intruded within the upper crust. So on the left here is um, some INSAR fringes showing uplift around the Sisters Volcanic Complex here in the Cascades. On the right here from Brad Singer et al is kind of conceptual diagram of what's going on in a magma chamber above which they've observed uplift rates of over 20 centimeters per year in recent years. So these kind of astounding uplift rates um, compared to like what we generally expect from tectonics. And these two things kind of work in concert. This is um, a cycle showing cycles in Akmat Caldera in Alaska where as you move through time, you get a buildup of volume within the magma chamber, resulting in inflation on the surface, as seen as the INSAR fringes on the right, and then eruptions that kind of allow that volume to escape the surface. And so one of the challenges, the fundamental challenges of seeing how volcanic arcs are built is that we tend to see these events as very episodic and spatially localized. And so we need to ask how these sorts of events integrate over time to, to contribute to the building of entire mountain ranges. So because this is a complicated question, we would like to know where is the best place on earth where we could go study this? And for my money, the best place on earth is the Columbia River Gorge, um, just right over there. So why is this the perfect place to study arc formation? Um, well, because of the Columbia River. So this is a map of the fluvial network of the Columbia. It's a massive basin. It drains eight US states. 
two Canadian provinces, a bunch of most of its sources in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and as it approaches the coast, this in huge volume and thus river uh, that has a massive erosive power cuts through the Cascade Arc here, just east of Portland, all funnels down and cuts through the Cascades. And so provides this perfect geologic cross section of the mountain range. We're now going to look at a view um, where we're kind of hovering above Mount Rainier, looking at topography, looking south down along the Oregon Cascades. So this is what it looks like. We got Portland here, kind of on the right side. Um, this line of volcanoes making the modern arc front. We can see that the highest topography in this case is associated with these big stratocones, these persistent uh, loci of magmatism. And then cutting directly across this is the Columbia River. And here's what we kind of think of as the Columbia River Gorge. So because this river is so big and so persistent, it um, has been cutting through the arc so forcibly for its entire known history that it's managed to maintain sort of a quasi-static base level to surrounding topography. This is going to allow us to use tools of fluvial geomorphology to look at the time history of uplift in the Cascades, particularly in these fluvial profiles outlined in blue, the bottom part of this figure. Um, but the other thing that makes this perfect is that the Columbia has persisted across the arc through a kind of this persistent topographic low known as the Columbia Transarc Lowland for its entire known 17 million year history. And in that time, the channel has been inundated by Columbia River flood basalts um, coming from far to the east as well as basalts originating in the Cascades. And that's kind of pushed the channel around and left behind these infilled paleo channels to provide strain markers to help us understand kind of how the crust has deformed in geologic history. And um, we are in this talk mostly going to focus on this dashed pink paleo channel. It's called the Bridal Veil vale Channel. And this is where the Columbia sat at the end of CRB emplacement. Um, but starting about three and a half million years ago, there was a flare up of regional magmatism. Um, this caused the channel to fully fill with fluvial gravels in this matrix of hyaloclastite, which is a rock formed when uh, basaltic magmas erupt straight into water. And so the channel fully filled with the sediment before being capped with lava flows from the Cascades. And these lava flows push the Columbia north to its present course. And so in this inset figure here, um, we see these pink polygons are the hyaloclastite deposits representing the Bridal Veil vale Channel, this Columbia Paleo Channel. The green polygons are these channel capping flows. And here we see the modern Columbia um, crossing the inset figure there. One thing that's very handy about these hyaloclastite deposits is they're very easy to identify in a world defined by pretty homogeneous looking basalt. Um, so this is a view of Columbia River flood basalt. This is the dominant bedrock that forms the walls of the gorge. As we go up through these Columbia River basalt flows, we start to see this brown blob here in the middle. This is the Bridal Veil vale channel. So this is that hyaloclastite matrix. And then this really defined line on top um, shows the line where these younger basalt flows from the Cascades flowed in, pushing the river north. And then we'll pan around here and we can see how far these deposits have been uplifted above the modern Columbia. I should point out that we are far from the first people to think of this. Um, in his 1923 guidebook to the historic Columbia River Highway, Ira Williams wrote, what a wonderful stroke of good fortune it is then that instead of such scattered and often meager opportunity to actually observe the nature of the deeper makeup and so vast in earth structures, a range of mountains, there should be ready made and waiting for the interpretive eye of the geologist, so grand a section of the Cascade Range from top to bottom as the Columbia has made. And then he supplied his take on the cross-sectional view of the Cascades. The main thing he's focused on, it's a little hard to see um, at this scale, but is the Columbia River flood basalts. 
uh, the Cascadian basalts forming the topography on top, and then these little lenses of gravel um, sandwiched between them. In fact, in 1915, J. Harlan Bretz came out with a figure that also identified these gravels, and by looking at fossils uh, and similar gravels on the west side of the Cascades, deduced in this paper that he thought the Cascades must be of quaternary age. In 1931, a UO professor named Edwin Hodge took a bunch of grad students on a 14-week mapping campaign where their primary focus was mapping the top of the CRB, the contact with Cascadian basalts and some of these lava flows. This would eventually um, turn into this figure, one of his grad students, John Elliott Allen, who would become a PSU professor, um, made this more detailed figure. And so basically you just see versions of this cross-section pop up in the literature kind of throughout um, geologic history. And as we've gained more detail on the deformation that this stuff records, a couple of main structures start to come into focus. And so these are the main structures that I'm going to be focused on in this research. Um, maybe first and foremost is this arching deformation of the Columbia River flood basalts, of which there's been around 900 meters in the last three and a half million years. This arch is capped by all this erupted material from modern cinder cones and strato cones. Um, and then this deformation falls off to the east into the Hood River Valley where there's been a pretty large amount of normal faulting. Um, in fact, up to 600 meters of down to the west normal faulting since about 3 million years ago. Um, so these are the structures we're going to try and understand in this talk. And so we're going to ask, and the question I initially posed is how were the modern cascades built? And so the first thing we need to ask is what are the relative contributions of tectonic first magmatic processes in generating these dominant structural features? We're going to take a look at regional plate kinematics and then propose a model that argues that structures can most easily be explained as entirely magmatic in origin. Then we can ask how steady has magma flux into the cascades been throughout the quaternary if magma is what's forming these structures. We can use tools of geomorphology um, and argue that fluvial tributaries of the Columbia River show that magmatism is steady and ongoing when viewed on million year time scales. If you buy those two things, then we can kind of figure out some interesting um, information about activity in the arc. For example, we can constrain long-term magma flux rates in this section of the Cascades, which we constrain to being on the order of 10 cubic kilometers per million years per kilometer of arc. And we can also get constraints on how magma is partitioned between the surface and subsurface and calculate a lower bound intrusive extrusive ratio of two to one. Okay, so starting with the first question, let's think about the dominant tectonic field. It turns out that regional tectonics are pretty well understood. Um, it's been shown from paleomagnetic data, as well as high precision GPS, that the Cascadia four arc block is rotating clockwise relative to the rest of the North American plate. So here we see these uh, motion vectors, and then here, this dashed red line is the outline of the modern arc. Um, these yellow lines are these rift, arc marginal rift structures, this, for this north one being the Hood River Fault Zone, which we're going to be talking about. And then here up on the top right is kind of the well-known topographic expression of this plate rotation. This is the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt. It's a set of east-west trending compressional structures um, they run almost perfectly orthogonal to the strike of the arc and kind of orthogonal to the deformation that we're trying to understand. And so it's hard in looking at this tectonic field to come up with a good kinematic explanation for those features in the gorge, either the uplift or the arc marginal rifting. We can also look at the relative time scales of um, these processes 
and try and see that the tectonic explanation doesn't provide us a good explanation. And so we're going to go back to the view looking south down along the arc. Um, and so we know that the Cascade Arc has been roughly where it is today for about 40 million years. We know that the Columbia River has been crossing the arc for at least 17 million years. And we know that these Yakima fold structures have been developing, or they were developing throughout emplacement of the Columbia River flood basalts. And so that tells us that that rotation field was likely active throughout CRB emplacement. And so has been more or less the same for about the last 15 million years. And then we have this initiation of gorge uplift and displacement along the Hood River fault zone, which happened less than three and a half million years ago. And so some variable had to change that allowed for the development of these structures. And maybe the most obvious big change we see in the region is a noted flare up in magmatism throughout the Oregon section of the arc. And so this here is just a um, map showing quaternary, identified quaternary vents uh, as a function of latitudes. The gorge is right up in here. Um, see, this goes all the way down to Lassen in California. And basically for the previous 10 million years or so, the arc hadn't shown a lot of activity. There's not really a lot of evidence that it was very active, but suddenly we get this massive flare up. Um, and so these plots that just showed up on the right are just showing some of the inferred extrusion rates, distributions of different kinds of volcanoes. Um, but basically we get this onset in the cascades of a lot of magmatism in central Oregon, kind of down by Newberry, um, that happened coincident with this arc marginal rifting. And then both the magmatism and the rifting propagated northward up into the gorge by about three and a half million years ago. And in reading through the literature and learning about geology of the area, you find that there's kind of this paradigm we tend to fall into, which is that, okay, these rift structures started to develop. That's what allowed this magma to come to the surface. And kind of the implication there is then that the location of the arc is being driven by these surface structures, these surface faults and features. And so that's an idea that I want to push back on a little bit as I kind of build this magmatic forcing argument. So this is the figure I showed earlier that shows kind of these arcs developing in a range of different tectonic settings. And sort of one of the main takeaways that I got from the paper I pulled this figure from is that arcs, the line of volcanoes associated with arcs tend to be pretty narrowly constrained. Um, so it forms these kind of laterally pretty tight um, topographic mountain ranges. They run parallel to the trench. And while actual eruption rates do tend to kind of co-vary with tectonics where extension uh, is correlated with higher eruption rates, it seems like the location of the arc and the presence of a large topographic mountain range on the order of tens of kilometers doesn't seem to care too much with what these plates are doing up top. And from a volcanology perspective, um, I think this isn't too surprising. And so the idea in that community is that, you know, you have the subduction zone, the downgoing plate is being pushed down to a depth where you start to get the feedbacks that generate magma. And so you have all these parameters of the subduction that dictate where this arc front is going to form. And so if you're going to change the location of an arc front, you do so by doing something like changing the subduction angle. Um, one example or one argument is this nature paper in 2010 by England and Katz. And they make this argument that you can actually figure out um, from where the arc is, the thermal conditions basically in the upper part of the wedge. In other words, basically how heat is flowing towards this kind of corner of the wedge dictates where magma is going to be focused, initiates the transcrustal magma system, and tells you where your volcanoes are going to pop up on the surface. 
And so now coming back to our geomorphology surface process perspective, the argument, I guess, the very root that I'm trying to make is that when we view this arc topography and this line of volcanoes and even this longer wavelength uplift off on the margins, we really need to view this as just the very tippy top of this giant transcrustal magma transport system, which has all of its own feedbacks and driving mechanisms. So I've hopefully at this point convinced you that magmatic processes actually at least play a major role in generating volcanic arcs. And so we need to revisit the question that I proposed early on in the talk, which is how do these spatially and temporally isolated magmatic events combine to build arc scale topography? And at first I'm going to sort of ignore the temporal component and just look at how these things build spatially. Um, and I can also plug some research, some exciting research coming out of the Karlstrom lab. So this is a paper that came out with Dan O'Hara as the lead author. And the idea here was to stochastically in place a bunch of intrusions into an elastic half space and look at what kind of topography developed on the surface. And so down here, all the little red dashes are our intrusions. Dash line is the mean depth of intrusions. And then we have a map view and a cross section of the topography that develops. Um, so, you know, maybe not surprising if you really think about the processes here, but you build up all these kind of discrete small intrusions and what you get is deformation on the surface at much longer wavelengths. Um, in other words, these kind of features that are much broader than each individual intrusion. Pretty intuitively, we saw that if you increase the cumulative intrusion volume, you increase the max topographic elevations on the surface, as seen as the plot on the left. And you also increase the relief, the topographic relief developed on the surface. Uh, each of these lines on these figures correlates with a different ratio of intrusion radius to mean depth, which is kind of how we started to classify these things. Maybe what was a little more surprising and um, is something that I think is worth spending some time thinking about is that we found that the surface response to these stochastically placed intrusions could be parameterized as the response of a thin elastic plate to a single basal force. Um, so on the left here is, you know, these red triangles, these are the mean intrusion depth and range of intrusion depths. And the black dots are the effective elastic thickness of a plate that could parameterize the topographic response. So we found this really neat linear relationship between the two. This is handy because A, a thin elastic plate model is much simpler than this elastic half space inflation model, especially when we don't really know a lot of the necessary parameters of depth. And then also we want a way to think of the surface of the earth as the top of this transcrustal magma system. And so having this thin elastic plate is kind of an easy way to conceptualize that. And so um, here's what we've got. We've got a volcano. We've got some amount of extrusive material erupted onto the surface. This is going to load um, the upper crust, and then we have this transcrustal magma system. And so as these magmas are bubbling their way up through the lithosphere, they're exerting a net upward force on this thin little region that we're going to call the quote unquote strong upper crust. And that is the thickness of that strong upper crust is what we're gonna define as the effective elastic thickness, or T sub E. So what does the strong upper crust mean? Well, people have put a lot of time, in fact, devoted entire careers to trying to come up with strength profiles for the lithosphere. And basically they come up with a bunch of different models that are all named after desserty junk food. Um, so here I show the creme brulee and jelly sandwich model, but um, I suppose the main thing you learn is that at depth, the strength profile of the crust is complicated depending on a ton of parameters. But at the very top, there's this linear section. And 
This section is where the strength of the crust is regulated by friction along faults. Um, and so basically the first thing that's gonna fail are these brittle faults. Friction increases with depth and pressure. And so you get this linear increase in strength down to some point known as the brittle ductal transition where any differential stress generated in the crust is going to be dissipated by viscous processes. And what makes this especially tricky is that there's different viscous timescales, which themselves depend on depth, um, chemistry, temperature profiles, and things like this. And so the location of that brittle ductal transition is highly timescale dependent. While this is on a vastly different time scale, I kind of like this figure demonstrates this concept. This is from a modeling study where they were looking at the amount of differential stress stored in the crust following a um, normal fault event. And so there was slip along this fault that reached down below this brittle ductal transition and for it around 10 kilometers. And so at time equals zero plus, you get this spike in differential stress um, centered around the fault tip. But the crust down there, the viscous relaxation happens fast enough that that differential stress is relaxed over the course of just about 100 years. Um, so basically on 100 year time scales, the crust down here appears fairly weak, while on 10 year time scales, it actually looks kind of strong. Um, and so when we're talking about effective elastic thickness, it's just really important to realize that we're talking about the depth below which differential stresses are dissipated by viscous processes on the time scale of interest. And so this is a quantity that depends on the time scale of both loading and the time scale of observation. But if we can constrain effective elastic thickness, there's been a ton of work being, that's been done to define the mechanical behavior of thin elastic plates, and it's fairly simple. So this figure here is showing the mechanical response of said thin elastic plates as a function of loading wavelength. And so on the left side is longer wavelength loads. So these are really big, broad spatial loads loaded to a thin elastic plate. And Context of geology, we can think of this as like an entire ice cap that we're gonna set on top of this plate. Um, and on the far right, we get the Bouger response. This is where the plate appears very strong. Um, so you have really small loads, you put them on this elastic plate, the plate really doesn't deform at all. Um, and then in the middle here is this flexural response where the plate is going to bend um, when subjected to a load and distribute the force across a characteristic flexural wavelength. And so looking just kind of from a, at a simple model, we'll look first at this far left end member behavior, the area response. Um, so here on the bottom, we're applying kind of a boxcar load. We're gonna assume it's pushing up on a thin elastic plate. This particular thin elastic plate has an effective elastic thickness of one kilometer solidly in that kind of left side end member behavior from the last figure. And we see that the form of the load is pretty much directly translated to the surface. And this is what is observed in things like ice cap loading or unloading or continental scale erosion. This is the isostatic response that you learned about. But so now we're gonna look at what happens in this flexural wave band. Here, we're applying the exact same boxcar load to a thin elastic plate where the effective elastic thickness is 20 kilometers. And in this case, the plate acts as a filter and attenuates the force across this characteristic flexural wavelength. And one of the ways you identify this kind of behavior is from these flexural bulges where the plate actually bends in the opposite direction along the margins of deformation. And this, in geologic context, this has been observed. It's actually um, was observed really early on in thinking about these geodynamic issue, uh, um, geodynamic processes. G.K. Gilbert noticed that this was happening in the Salt Lake Valley, a result of the lake losing volume over time. The other place that this has been really well identified is in um, 
ocean hotspots. So the Hawaiian island chain deposits these, you know, big piles of basalt on top of the crust. And we see this kind of deformation with flexural bulges on the margins of those islands. But now we want to bring it back to the Cascades and our study in the gorge. And so here's what we're proposing is happening. We've got this magma transport system. This is coming up from the downgoing slab and exerting kind of a persistent upward force on this strong upper crust. We have a brittle ductile transition, which is a point below which on these three million year time scales, this or any differential stress is being dissipated by viscous processes. And then we have this pretty strong elastic plate. It's kind of attenuating that forcing over this flexural wavelength. And one of the really interesting things that, that happens that I wanna talk about here is that you're actually kind of rearranging the stress state in the plate when you do this. Um, when you bend the plate up in the middle, near the center of deformation, you're forcing the upper part of the plate into tension. In the bottom part of the plate, you're forcing it into compression. As you move out to the margins, you're forcing, when you get into those flexural bulges, you're forcing the top part of the plate into compression. You're forcing the bottom part into tension. And, but there's these inflection points where there's kind of zero compressive stress. Um, and so we're gonna talk about this. You also generate these pretty strong bending stresses at the points of maximum bending in this plate. And so we can look at whether or not these align with different failure points and structural features within the Columbia Gorge. Uh, one interesting thing to note is it was there was a comment in the mapping done by Dave Sherrod of the Cascades that when this kind of quaternary magmatic arc-wide event started, they saw in dike orientations a reorientation of the stress state, um, which seems to support this idea. Okay, so. Um, in binning the elevations of the bridal veil channel and hyaloclastite data, we find that we can fit them with a thin elastic plate model pretty well. And so here we're looking, this is as if we're looking north at a cross section of the gorge. So we have easting on the x axis. Um, and Portland would be just off the left side of this. We're kind of coming down into like Troutdale or Gresham here on the left. Where we do see this relationship fall off is around the west side of the Hood River Valley. Uh, we can zoom in a little bit on that. This is kind of the uh, Mitchell Creek and Tunnel Lake fault zone. And we see that the hyaloclastite elevations fall off, but so do the elevations of these channel capping lava flows and some of the subsequent flows. And so it seems like what we're seeing here is maybe some post emplacement deformation caused by a faulting in the Hood River fault zone and kind of these adjacent faults. Okay, so that's how we expect kind of the spatial averaging of all these intrusions to maybe manifest on the surface, but we still would like to constrain this temporal component. And so to do that, we're going to use tools of fluvial geomorphology, which is probably the best way people have come up with to constrain uplift histories over broad spatial scales. So we're going to be looking at these drainage basins uh, highlighted in blue down here at the bottom. And it's worth noting that there is a transient topographic adjustment signal on the north side of Columbia as well. Um, so outlined in red here, these are all deep seated landslides. The reason we have those on the north side, not the south side, is there is a dominant north-south tilt in the Columbia River flood basalts through the gorge. And so there's a really nice slip surface for these big deep-seated landslides. That slip surface is buffered on the Oregon side, and so we can get the establishment of this nice fluvial topography. So the tools we're going to use are built on a pretty basic premise. The premise is that if you have a landscape uplifting, you're going to get some amount of erosion carrying material out of that landscape. And it would really like to evolve so that these two are equal and opposite. In other words, the landscape is trying to evolve towards mass balance conditions over geologic timescales. If these conditions are achieved, then river elevation profiles 
create this nice smooth concave up form. And so this is um, the elevation of a river with upstream distance from the mouth. And so you get this nice con smooth concave up profile in the channel. The other way to look at this that geomorphologists use a lot is by plotting the log of the slope next to the log of the upstream drainage area point in the channel. And those two are related by a power law relationship. And so you get this nice straight line in log log space. But if you change uplift conditions, how the river channel responds to try and reach new equilibrium conditions is by over steepening, which is how it increases its erosional efficiency. And so this creates a, what's known as a nick point, which is a kinematic wave of erosion that moves up the river profile at pretty slow rates on the order of uplift rates. So millimeters or maybe centimeters a year. And so identifying the location of a nick point, you can kind of back calculate um, if you can constrain things like nick point migration rate, things like this, you can back calculate a perturbation to uplift back to the mouth of the drainage. And if you have a bunch of different drainages that are all responding to the same shared base level, um, you can do this over kind of big spatial areas. It's going to be handy for us to do something called a chi transform. Um, this basically, the basis of this is that this concavity comes out of changing drainage area as you move upstream. The channel gets more steep to achieve the same erosional efficiency as upstream drainage area decreases. And so you can eliminate that concavity by normalizing over drainage area. So you do this chi transform. Uh, you have to identify this one parameter M. But if you do that correctly, then the steady state profile forms a straight line uh, in chi space. So chi on the x-axis here and elevation on the y-axis. And this is a really handy framework to approach these questions in because um, horizontal distances on the chi axis are linear related to a response time scale. Um, and so basically nick points will move up through a chi profile at a constant rate. And so it makes it really easy to see kind of um, relative initiations of uplift. This is what nick points look like in an adjusting system. Um, so in slope area space, it's just this kink in the linear trend. In chi space, we get these kind of two disparate linear profiles. And so in this case, this upper bit corresponds to a relic uplift rate and landscape was over uplifting more slowly. And so the slope is shallower. And then the steeper bit is a portion of the channel that's still responding to um, an increase in uplift rate. And so eventually through geologic time, this nick point will propagate back and the entire profile will be at the same slope. So this is, I guess, just a model conceptualization of just what I just showed you. Um, this is a high space profile, or here I have it plotted in terms of a response time. And so we get this step change in uplift happening 3 million years ago. And we get this nice kink in the linear relationship, these two sections of profiles. But because the response times are slow, if we have uplift perturbations on timescales of you know, 50 to 100,000 years, and we kind of zoom out and look at this nick point as one whole coherent chunk of profile, the slope pretty much just correlates with the average uplift rate um, throughout this whole period. And so this is gonna be really handy when we're talking with, about this magmatic forcing that does tend to be kind of um, temporally you know, erratic. Um, so the dominant slope of the channel represents the average uplift rate if these fluctuations in uplift are much shorter than the channel response time. So we look for evidence of this in the gorge. This is a view looking south at the horsetail and Onianta drainages. Um, and we see there's a bunch of these little black stars are waterfalls, which obviously one of the things the Columbia Gorge is really famous for. Um, 
We are pretty much of the opinion that these waterfalls are correlated with lithologic boundaries, mostly within the Columbia River flood basalts. So don't really represent one of these transient responses. But we do get this kind of broad um, difference in slope and concavity happens in the channel. So these slope break nick points uh, in both of these drainages. And so we go through those 16 south side tributary drainages and decompose each one into two dominant reaches or two sections where we think uplift rates were roughly the same. And so for each of these basins, we've got chi on the x-axis, elevation on the y-axis. The dashed yellow line represents the relict uplift rate within that drainage. Um, and the parts where it aligns are where the relict profile is still present. And then this dashed red line represents the nick point or the adjusting profile where conditions are equilibrated to these new uplift conditions. And so having these high values then allows us to look for, you know, basically a correlated trend with uplift of that hyloclastite band. And so we can map these nick points um, onto the uplift and vice versa. So we do a three parameter grid search inversion. Um, our three parameters are the total driving force of the uplift. So this is um, a total amount of pressure integrated under the an elastic plate that's going to push it up. We have an effective elastic thickness. So these are basically the two parameters that are going to be used to fit deformation in that hyloclastite data. And then we have this KS parameter, the channel steepness. And this is a really a parameter that's used a ton in fluvial geomorphology. How we can think of it here is this is a quantity that allows us to map nick point locations onto the uplift. And the fact that it collapses implies something really interesting about how these rivers work in volcanic landscapes, because there is this really nice correlation for a singular KS value between uplift from the flexural model and uplift from the nick point model kind of at the same point in the arc. So what this tells us is that the transient fluvial response is driven by this long wavelength uplift component along the arc. And um, in other words, way to think about that is we have this long wavelength uplift. We also have all these volcanoes erupting onto the surface that are creating that elevation change. But it seems like the rivers in their transient response don't really notice that constructional component, which is kind of a really interesting geomorph implication. Um, collapsing the data also requires this assumption that the erosional efficiency K of the system um, co-varies with uplift. This is a really interesting geomorph implication that I'm not gonna have time to go into right now, but I love talking about it. So if anyone wants to, please reach out. But now let's look at how well we have fit the data. So here again, we are looking on the x-axis at kilometers easting um, in UTM measurements. Again, Portland is kind of off to the left. We have the Hood River Valley here on the right side. The pink diamonds are elevations of the Bridal Veil vale Channel. This is the geologic strain marker we're trying to fit. This blue line is the fit of a thin elastic plate of our best fitting elastic thickness, which is 9.68 kilometers. The blue squares represent the implied uplift uh, or the uplift implied by nick point locations mapped from kind of our best fit KS value. And so we can see that it actually seems like this elastic flexure explains the data pretty well. The black line here is swath topography on the south side of the Columbia. And then this top plot is the volume weighted kernel density of quaternary vents within 15 kilometers of the Columbia River. And then, so this is basically just a measure of vent density on the surface. So we can think of it as kind of a relative measure of um, volcanic extrusion. And it's interesting that this has kind of this bimodal distribution that is out of phase with the top of intrusive uplift, which is where we would expect the majority of that transcrustal magma column to be focusing. Um, 
And we can also see that the highest topography doesn't necessarily correspond with the center of the arc. We have these pretty high kind of bulges off to the sides. This is Larch Mountain here and Mount Defiance right here for those of you who are familiar with gorge geography. So we'll talk more about that in a second, but the first thing we can do is calculate the intrusive flux rate by integrating under that flexural curve. We get something on the order of 10 cubic kilometers per million years per kilometer. By subtracting that from the swath topography, we get an upper bound extrusion rate of around six cubic kilometers per million years. And again, we see this kind of bimodal distribution in that. And we can calculate intrusive extrusive ratios of around two to one. And so you can remember we talked about these stress inflection points in the plate, and I know I'm about out of time here, but the argument we're going to try and make or the hypothesis we're advancing is that the focusing of magma out from the arc axis corresponds with those um, stress inflection points. In other words, you have this fluid trying to work its way up through the upper crust. And anywhere the crust is in compression is going to act to occlude this fluid. And so it's going to preferentially move towards these zones of zero compressive stress. We can also look at these points of maximum bending. So where the plate is most stressed by the bending moments established in um, the elastic flexure. And we see that we get this really strong stress maximum um, that aligns pretty directly with the Hood River fault zone. And you know, if you're looking at this from like an engineering perspective and you just have an elastic beam and you're trying to figure out where it's going to break, it would probably break right here and the sense of motion you would get would be what we see along the Hood River Fault Zone. So in summary, um, I've argued that the Columbia Gorge uplift is caused by increased magma intrusion, intrusion through the quaternary. Also argued that fluvial nick points are correlated with quaternary increase in magmatism, suggesting a steady ongoing magma flux into the arc. And argued that bending stresses in the upper crust are responsible for initiation of the Hood River Fault Zone, as well as the focusing of erupted magmas away from the arc axis. With that, in addition to my collaborators, I would love to thank the entire Carlstrom Lab Group, um, as well as the Lab Group of Josh Roaring, um, which let me hang out with them quite a bit. Um, this was partially funded by the Cascades Volcanic Observatory and the family of Jack Kleinman in the form of the Kleinman Memorial Grant. And obviously there's so many other people who have had great simulating conversations and adventures with that have inspired this research. And of course, thanks to you all for having me. And with that, I can take any questions. <laughs>